Well, let's get a view from the other side of the scarlet and gray septic tank with our good friend and maybe only reasonable bucknut Mark Rogers. He himself has a fantastic channel here on YouTube, the voice of college football. Good to see you, my friend. Hope you are well. And I laid out at the beginning here why I frankly, as a fan, I got a little choked up uh, watching the game on Saturday just because a lot of the fun I've had and enjoyment and escape, um, you know, from life's difficulties I've had going back to when I was a kid. Uh, watching Michigan football since I was in the fifth grade, a lot of that the last 15 years has beaten out of me, particularly the last few. And uh, I'd kind of become a maize and blue Grinch about Michigan football. My heart had grown two sizes too small. And it thawed a little bit um, that, you know, we just don't win this game anymore uh, for the last 15 years. We're not the team that makes the play or two at the end when really for my, you know, the first 30 years I was a fan we did. These were the games we always won. It was, you know, then go on the road and lose at Purdue when you run your nose guard and goal line. That's the game we lost, okay? But, you know, these pivotal kind of moments were often the moments that Michigan football culture shined through. And it's it, those have been, we don't have those what losses under Harbaugh anymore, but we don't have any real marquee wins either. And I just, I, I was just tickled. To, that we actually, I, to me, it was more important to win it that way than to go in there and just kind of play your best game and blow a six and three team out of the water. That we had to overcome that adversity. The other coach had to make the mind numbed game management decisions for once. That we had to fall behind and make the clutch plays and then get the key stops. Because to me, I think that's a paradigm breaker for Michigan football. It might not mean anything two weeks from now. And you know, I don't really care about two weeks from now anyway. I mean, I, I'd be satisfied if we were just clearly the second best program in this league because we can't even beat Penn State and Michigan State consistently before even worrying about two weeks from now. So I, I just I think this was a very important win. But what do you think? Well, it's nice for me to actually witness this. And uh, I did see your tweets and uh, to witness this now uh, face to face to be able to see some joy out of you. I I I enjoy that. I want to see this every day out of the year out of you, except for the time we get together after that game next week. (laughs) Uh, Jim Harbaugh, after the game, I know that he showed some exuberance after the Nebraska win, but I think that was kind of yanked out of him by Aiden Hutchinson kind of grabbing his shoulders and saying, (laughs) Coach, we did it. Yeah, Wake up. Let's go. Uh, This is good. Uh, but against Penn State, he was he was having fun. He was exuberant after the game. Thought it was fun what he did um, with the sideline reporter. I don't know who that was. Molly McGrath. Anyway, with the side, it really yes. ticked her off. Molly by the way, McGrath. she was really ticked off after that. Yeah, that's what I heard. I didn't see anything directly from her posted, but no, I just watched that. the video. And, and when he gets to the end, the look on her face, she's not happy. But go ahead. Yeah. Well, it wasn't like he ble- he yes he blew her off, but he he wanted. The, the players to shine. Mm-hmm. So he grabs Eric all. He got her a good interview anyway. I know she wants to talk to the guy, but still he was just having a good time. She should have had fun with that. Been like, Oh man, he's going to celebrate with his players. He just, he was truly excited about the win and felt just overjoyed for his players. And Hey, we did it. And that was a great game. And, and I don't care what anyone says. You know what the deal is with college football and with these games. The aftermath from the critics and the, the uh, glass half empty people is always, well, then you got to downgrade the team that you just beat. Well, right. they really weren't that good. And I know they're 6-4, right. and four, but that— But if they had won that, that game, Penn State, Penn State would have been team, 16th or 17th in the, in the playoff rankings tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. They are legitimately a good team. They are one of the— 20 best teams in the country easily even beat up. They are, I don't care what their record is. They beat a good team in a difficult environment on the road and got it done. Do, do we, are we, are we at the point now that, I mean, last year happened, those games count, but in the last few weeks I've noticed with that my handicapping on on my Patreon page has improved dramatically. And the only thing different I'm doing is I have just decided to completely and totally disregard in my own assessment and power ratings what I thought of these teams based whatsoever off of anything we saw last year. And can we just safely, because at, at the very least, he has the program back to where it was in 2018. They were 9-1 and one that year. 
they got to 10 and one, and then they played Ohio State at the end, that we could be looking at a situation where next week, you know, Ohio State plays Michigan State and Oregon's on the road at Utah. Both Ohio State and Michigan could be in the top four next week heading into that game. And if you're a Michigan fan and you look at, you know, programs like Purdue and the investment that they make in football now is nothing compared to what they were doing in the 80s and 90s. That at this point, your hope is let's just get to that last game of the year and have it be for the championship. And if we survived enough to get to that point, then that was probably a pretty good season. We'll see what happens. At the very least, has he has he rebuilt it to that point, do you think? Darren Orlovsky made a comment during the game that he believed that Michigan was one of the four best teams in the country. I'm not going to quite get to that. Uh, I think that there's such a drop-off after a after Alabama and Ohio State, I don't know. But yes, so people don't want to hear this. Michigan fans don't want to hear this. Anybody who just says, okay, it's a gold medal society, uh, and that's why we judge uh, programs to be elite and nothing else matters, the Super Bowl losers of failure, all of that, don't want to hear this. But that game in Ann Arbor in two weeks, if it is a competitive, close game, yes, it's going to be a bitter defeat for Michigan losing 38-31. But that will prove so much that if they're able to hang in that game and then you start to judge, okay, next year, got to win it, all that. Uh, and not that this team's not capable of possibly pulling off that upset, but it will matter if they're competitive versus 56-28. There's two things I think they have going for them that they haven't in the past. One, the ability, and this is what you saw the Buccaneers do with Pat Mahomes in the Super Bowl. This is what you saw the Giants do to Tom Brady twice in Super Bowls. The ability to sit back with seven guys and get pressure on the quarterback with four. I mean, we're... We might have David Ojabo and Aiden Hutchinson might both end up breaking Michigan's sack record. And this just in, Michigan's had a lot of good defensive players and won a lot of games, you know, for the last 130 years. That That's, you know, there's a lot of guys that have made a lot of money playing on Sundays that didn't set that sack record. Both these guys might do it. And you you really can't afford to roll your... Um, to roll your protection to one side. Teams tried that. You know, Aiden got off to that great start, so they rolled their protection over there, and then David Ojabo just friggin' went Brandon Graham and went off. And now teams don't know what to do, and the only thing you can do, frankly, is to leave a tight end and a back in on both ends to chip, but then that stops you from putting four receivers out in the route on every single position possession as well. I think that's something that's different. The ability to say, all right, we're just going to play these seven guys, keep you in front of us, you're not going over the top. We'll keep you in front of us, and we're going to play these seven guys back here and just get pressure with the front four. It's been it's been several years since Michigan had a defense or a scheme. I think when they had Chase Winovich and Rashawn Gary, they could have done that, but that wasn't the scheme we ran under Don Brown, right? So I think it's the first time that the scheme and talent along those lines in this current era of Ohio State dominance lines up that Michigan thinks that it has a chance to just play, to just rush the passer with just four. I think that is a difference. I think the other difference is just the toughness. I've just seen Michigan take a lot of punches in this this season that in the past it has not taken uh, and not recovered from. And I think those two things are different than what Ohio State has faced with Michigan the majority of these last 15 years. Doesn't mean it'll change the outcome or anything at all, but I do think that those are two things that Ohio State cannot just simply check a box and say, this is the same team we, we, we named the score against in 2018-2019. Yeah, you're going to the same well I was going to. I had the same um, framework in my mind heading into this conversation was the great equalizer is superior pass rush. Patriots, Giants, Super Bowl, the classic example, you named a few other ones where, yes, from week to week, watch that Patriots team in 2007. Nobody was close. They were blitzkrieging everyone like Ohio State did against, you know, who else is doing to Purdue, what Ohio State did last week to Purdue. No one. Purdue has been a really capable team this year against everyone and obviously has the two top five wins. But Ohio State, 
when given a couple opportunities, couple mistakes, or just needing to drive the length of the field. Um, you know, somebody asked me the other day to compare Cade McNamara and CJ Stroud. And I said, well, on one hand, CJ Stroud looks like the best player. That's the, that's the default answer. But Cade McNamara showed me something against Michigan State. He made throws that I haven't seen C.J. Stroud need to make. Uh, he had helmets in his chest, was throwing, anticipating in windows. He was making NFL throws repeatedly. I don't know if he just played out of his mind that one game or he's capable of doing that again. But C.J. Stroud throws to guys who are wide open, yeah. waving their hands up constantly. Nothing against him. He's doing what the play requires and obviously throw to the open man, but he's got three of them. It's seemingly on every play, but this might be the defense that might be able to collapse on him just repeatedly and start to rattle him with those two bookends and make it really fun to watch. Correct me if I'm wrong. I believe Michigan's the first team to score three offensive touchdowns against Penn State this year. Because didn't Penn, didn't Ohio State kick four field goals, get a defensive touchdown, and then score Absolutely. two offensive touchdowns? Yes. So I think Michigan is the first team to score three offensive touchdowns against Penn State. They scored all three on long fields. None of them were set up by some kind of sudden change, you know, turnover deep in their own end. And they had, of course, those blustery conditions uh, with the winds and the cold and everything else there. So what does that say to you? Maybe he says nothing. I don't know. I mean, we're, we are only talking about 21 points here, which is pretty pedestrian by modern college football standards. But what does that say, if anything, to you? And what about Hassan Haskins and what factor he could be in this game? Uh, it, it's one thing to see these guys uh, run hard and then get taken off the field. You know, both you and I remember when the the same 11 played on that side of the football, regardless of position. And now you see so many guys, uh, you know, running back up by committee, even main running backs being relieved on a regular basis. But Hassan Haskins losing Blake Corum, you know, it's one thing, again, to run hard, but to do it repeatedly against NFL players, hitting, knocking heads with NFL players on the other side of the ball repeatedly 31 times. And that's going to be something that I don't know that Ohio State's seen either, just a guy that's that is just an offensive line and a back that's going to lean on you with that kind of determination, talent, and will in the fourth quarter. To me, Hassan Haskins is Leroy Horde if they still wore the big pads from the 80s because, I mean, they're just, they're, they're extremely similar. But any, you know what? We've spent a lot of time talking about an event that's two weeks away. Now, these two teams got games this weekend. And, you know, Ohio State is finishing, I think, with I think the toughest gauntlet in college football here down the stretch. You're good at, you know, you've had a top 25 Purdue who had already beaten two top 10 teams. Now you're going to play top 10 Michigan State. Then you're going to play maybe top five Michigan. And then you're going to play, if you win all three of those games, then you go play a top 15 or so resurgent Wisconsin, who I think has has given up or has has scored more points in the last few weeks. Uh, or given up fewer points in the last few weeks than Northwestern has scored or something this season. Uh, I mean, it's 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 the, the stats with what Wisconsin has done are kind of nuts. Any worries here? We're kind of looking ahead. I mean, you know, you do you do have maybe a pro quarterback there at Maryland. I don't know who he's throwing to because their fourth receiver now. It's pretty much Raheem Jarrett, and I don't know who the rest of their receivers are. But uh, you know, and, and Michigan State is not chopped liver. You know, Michigan played that same defense against Michigan State we're talking about, where they set the seven guys back and rushed the four and got a lot of pressure on the quarterback, and then they gave up five rushing touchdowns to Kenneth Walker. Okay, playing playing soft up front. Now I could see Travion Henderson having a day like that in in response. But any are, are we are we looking ahead too quickly here? Are these any of the either one of these two teams in any real danger this weekend? See, because I don't think they are. I don't think Michigan's going to win like forty to ten. I could see it being like twenty eight seventeen. It was never really that close. Michigan just got in and got the job done. But I mean, this I I know what Michigan State's pass defense looks like. And pretty much every FBS quarterback they've played this year has had their best game of the season against them uh, from a yardage standpoint until Little Tua this past week. But And the only exception was the Western Kentucky quarterback because he threw for like 400 and something against somebody else. So, I mean, I, I to me, I, I, I think, just think it's a bad matchup for Michigan State. I, I just... 
I don't know how they cover those receivers at Ohio State because they don't generate the organic pass rush either that Michigan does. Yeah, so looking at Ohio State, Michigan State first, the Spartans are giving up uh, just truckloads of yardage, and it's not garbage yardage. It's legit. Aiden O'Connell only missed on 12 or 14 passes out of 54 attempts for 536. Same thing this last weekend against Maryland in a fairly competitive game. So I think the secondary issues at Michigan State are are legit. So Ohio State, a 19-point favorite against a team that's roughly top five in the country is just insane. But Yeah, I don't know if they'll cover that, that. But I, to me, I think it's like <laughs> going to be 38-28, but they were never really threatened. Does that sound yeah, about right to you? I, I, I thought the point spread against Purdue was too much, and it turned out not to be. The difference um, so, is Purdue doesn't have a Kenneth Walker to run up to to to, to keep you honest yeah. at the point of attack. They don't have any kind of running balance like that. At Absolutely. All. You know, I think Maryland is what Maryland always is, except they've got a quarterback, a capable quarterback now. So they've got a NFL player on each level of the defense, but it's not good enough to make up for a generally an awful defense and they've got speed on the outside of wide receiver, even though they lost uh, one of their best Dante Demas several weeks ago, but they've got a capable quarterback, but he turns the ball over too much. So they give you the splash plays. They can give you the big plays, but overall, yeah, it's just not a, it's a thin football team trying to play in the big 10 against much better competition. And yeah, that Michigan wins that game in the, 34 17 range mark great stuff as always man we'll talk to you later all right take care of a great week good to see you you bet